Ah, today's video is brought to you by Magic Spoon. Mm. Regular viewers of this channel know that I love cereal. Who doesn't love cereal? It's not a controversial statement, but cereal sadly doesn't always love you back thanks to all of those sugars and calories and oh my god, all of that stuff that you're not supposed to eat as an adult. Anyway, along come Magic Spoon and they're like, yo, yo, Simon, check this out. What's this deal? Zero total sugars, five grams of net carbs, 14 grams of protein. Basically, they've taken cereal and they've made it healthy. And you'd think, oh, well, that already exists. That already exists. We've got like, I don't know if you Americans ever been like Alpen. <laughs> it's like, yeah, yeah, it's good for you, but it tastes horrible, allegedly. Now look, I'm not a nutritional expert, but I know that zero total sugars, less carbs and more protein generally good for you. Did I say that it tastes awesome at the same time? Oh yeah, I made the Alpen comparison. Now originally they had four flavors, cocoa, fruity, frosted and blueberry. Then they added a couple of ones, which I thought blew the original ones out of the water. Not that the original ones weren't great, but peanut butter and cinnamon were game changers. And now there's even more. I got some of them here. I oh, know this is, this is, well, sorry. These are the peanut butter and the cinnamon ones. This is a new one, gingerbread. This is the one I was just eating, honey nuts. It's, uh, it's all fantastic stuff. Go to magicspoon.com forward slash side projects, grab a variety bundle and try it all out. Use my promo code side projects, you get $5 off. Magic Spoon's also got a 100% happiness guarantee. So if you don't like it, you get your money back. Perfect. And now today's video. Ever since mankind started to use ships to transport valuable cargo, there have been legends of lost ship graveyards which conceal unimaginable wealth. You only need to look at the popularity of such stories as Treasure Island or the hugely successful Pirates of the Caribbean franchise to see just how easily people could become obsessed with the dream of finding lost treasure. And although a lot of stories of actual lost treasure are certainly works of fiction or at least hugely exaggerated, there are in fact many lost treasures still out there waiting to be found. Today we're going to look at some of those treasures and the stories behind their disappearances. Back in Deptford, London in 1627, the 700-ton merchant royal was a galleon owned by British merchants and captains by John Limbury. During the 1630s, Limbury took advantage of the period of peace between England and Spain and began trading with Spanish colonies in the New World. In 1637, whilst returning from a lucrative trading mission in the Caribbean, the ship stopped off in Cadiz in southern Spain for badly needed repairs. Towards the end of a three-year stay, a Spanish ship that had been scheduled to make a delivery of silver coins and gold ingots to France was completely destroyed by fire, and Captain Limbury, seeing an opportunity to increase his profits, offered to make the delivery to Antwerp on his way back to London. There has been some speculation that Limbury himself was behind the fire that destroyed the original ship, but no evidence has ever been found to support this theory. The Merchant Royal set sail from Cadiz in late August 1661 and was immediately joined by her sister ship, the Dover Merchant. Unfortunately, it soon became apparent that the repairs had been unsuccessful, and the Merchant Royal began to take on water at a rapid rate. Although the ship was equipped with six pumps, designed to deal with just such an emergency, it was not long before they all brilliantly stopped working. This combined with extreme weather conditions caused the ship to sink approximately 30 miles from Land's End on the Cornish coast. Only 18 of the listed 83 people on board were lucky enough to be rescued by the merchant Dover. The remaining 65 people were lost along with the vast fortune aboard. So, just how much in today's money would this vast haul of treasure be worth? Well, the exact number is almost impossible to quantify. Between various news outlets, treasure hunters, and also people in internet forums, the number is listed as anything between 250 million and 20 billion dollars quite a range there, guys. Fortunately, it is possible to narrow this down just a little bit. According to a 1641 pamphlet held by the British Library, the ship went down with 300,000 in ready bullion and 100,000 pounds in gold and as much value in jewels. These numbers are similar to the figures listed in Charles I's State Papers of September the 30th, 1641. In these papers, he describes the loss of the cargo as the greatest that was ever sustained in one ship, being worth 400,000 pounds at least. If we accept this number as correct, then in today's money, it would be worth approximately £48.5 million or nearly $69 million. Even if we consider changes in the price of gold and silver and also add the value of the large amount of gold, jewels and other treasures that each individual crew member is likely to have gathered themselves, the total value of the cargo is estimated to be somewhere between $150 and $300 million today. At the time of writing, the wreck of the Merchant Royal has not yet been discovered. Several high-profile searches have been undertaken, including 
including one by the Discovery Channel's treasure hunters, but the closest that anybody has come to actually locating the vessel was in 2019, when a fishing trawler accidentally pulled up an anchor that, after meticulous study, is believed to have come from the Merchant Roll. Even this small find has led to renewed efforts by treasure hunters and archaeologists alike. In Lisbon, Portugal, in 1502, the Flor de Lamar, or Flower of the Sea, was one of the largest Carrick vessels of the time. The ship's maiden voyage, also in 1502, saw her travel from Portugal to India on a trading voyage. She would return the next year carrying a huge cargo of extremely valuable Indian spices. She would attempt to repeat this journey in 1505, but on the return leg of the journey, the crew would be forced to stop in Mozambique for almost a year so that the vessel could undergo extensive repairs. In 1507, the Flor de Lamar would make the transition from a cargo ship to warship when she participated in the Portuguese conquest of Ormuz. She would go on to take part in the Battle of Diu in 1508 and in the conquest of Goa in 1510. 1511 would also see the Flor de la Mar involved in military action when the Portuguese forcibly took control of the Sultanate of Malacca, whose capital city, also called Malacca, was believed to be the wealthiest city in the world at the time. Once Malacca had fallen and become part of the Portuguese Empire, much of that wealth was loaded onto the Flor de la Mar so that it could be transported back to the court of King Manuel I in Lisbon. Unfortunately, due to the design flaws with the ship, it was incredibly difficult to maneuver when fully loaded. This, coupled with many rushed repairs over the years, meant that the ship was perhaps not the best choice for transporting this vast fortune. When the Flor de la Mar left Malacca in November 1511, not only was she carrying the previously mentioned riches, but she had also been loaded with a substantial tribute from the King of Siam to King Manuel I. It is believed that about one month after she departed, she ran into a severe storm along the coast of Sumatra and while attempting to wait out the storm, she was smashed to pieces on the shoreline. One report from the time said that the ship was wrecked on a beach. As a result, the ship broke in two, and its back, which was embedded in the sand, was demolished by the waves. Along with the ship, the treasure was also lost. However, another report claims that the majority of the treasure was later salvaged by the Portuguese. Although many attempts to find the wreckage have been made, nobody has ever managed to conclusively prove that they found it. According to one treasure hunter, it's highly unlikely the wreckage would have survived this long due to the fact that the ship crashed on the shore and did not sink in the open sea. Any searches are further complicated by the fact that the alleged crash site is a zero-visibility dive area, which makes it highly unlikely that the lost treasure is ever going to be discovered. Built during the 1580s in Goa by Constantino de Braganza, the Cinque Chagas, or Five Wounds, was another Portuguese carrack. Approximately 150 feet long and 45 feet wide, this vessel was truly a giant for its time. Capable of carrying over a thousand passengers along with hundreds of tons of cargo, the Cinque Chagas was an excellent choice when it came to transporting large amounts of spices, treasure, and slaves back to Portugal from their Indian colonies. In 1594, the ship set sail from Goa to Lisbon on what would be her final voyage. On board was cargo worth 3.5 million Portuguese cruzados, the currency of the time, along with 22 treasure chests filled with diamonds, rubies, and pearls. Before departing, the captain would also take on board 400 slaves to be sold back in Spain. From the outset, the journey was fraught with difficulty. Improperly preserved food went bad, and the extremely hot weather meant that supplies had to be severely rationed. On top of this, it was reported that there was an outbreak of the plague which killed up to 500 of the passengers in one week. Meanwhile, in England, the Earl of Cumberland, George Clifford, was making plans to capitalize on the current state of war between England and Spain. During this time, Portuguese and Spanish cargo ships were considered fair targets, and Clifford planned to take full advantage of this. His small fleet of four ships set sail from Plymouth on the 6th of April, 1594, and succeeded in capturing several ships off the coasts of Spain and Portugal. On the 22nd of June, as they approached the Faroe Islands, they crossed paths with the Las Cinque Chagas. It's believed that the resulting battle lasted for almost an entire day. The English made three attempts to board the ship, but were repelled by the superior numbers of Portuguese. After regrouping, they would make one final attempt, and would ultimately be successful in boarding the vessel. However, at this point, fire raged through much of the vessel, and everybody, English and Portuguese alike, abandoned her to her fate. The only eyewitness report from the battle states that the sea was purple with blood dripping from the scuppers, the decks cluttered with the dead, and the fire raging in some parts of the ship, and the air so filled with smoke that not only we could sometimes not see each other, 
other, but we could not recognize each other. Several hours after the ship was abandoned, fire reached the source of gunpowder, and there was a huge explosion which caused the ship and all its cargo to vanish immediately beneath the waves. Due to the extreme depths of the ocean in that particular area, no trace of the wreck or the estimated half a billion dollars in treasure has ever been found. Built in 1888 by Napier, Shanks, and Bell, and owned by the Canadian Pacific Navigation Company, the SS Islander was a luxury steamer whose sole purpose was to travel back and forth along the inland passage to Alaska. Due to the luxury, she often played host to wealthy businessmen, bankers, railroad tycoons, and anybody else who may have had a stake in the Klondike goldfields. As a result of this, she often carried a large share of gold bullion that had been checked through the Gold Commissioner's office in Dawson. On the 14th of August 1901, the Islander would leave Skagway, Alaska, heading for Victoria in British Columbia. According to the 104 passengers and 61 crew members, the ship is reported to have been carrying $6 million in gold dust and gold bars, which equates to approximately $200 million today. According to reports, the journey started out incredibly smoothly, with the ship traveling through unusually calm waters for the area. This would all change at about 2 a.m. on the 15th of August, when while passing between Douglas Island and Admiralty Island, the ship would collide with a large iceberg that had most probably come adrift from a glacier located in nearby Taco Inlet. The impact tore a large hole in the front left-hand side of the ship, and within five minutes, she had taken on so much water that her entire front half was submerged and her rudder and propellers were lifted completely out of the water. Fifteen minutes later, she would sink beneath the waves. According to reports, 16 crew members and 23 passengers would lose their lives. However, it is possible that this number may be slightly higher, as there were reports of 11 stowaways aboard and these were never accounted for. One of the surviving passengers, Charles Ross, would later give an account of the sinking to a journalist, and the following is a brief extract from the resulting article. He and his wife were in bed when he felt the shock. He leapt up, but an officer passed by and told him there was nothing the matter. A few moments later, he heard something like chopping going on above and went on deck. The largest and best lifeboat was in the water with eight of the crew on board. The lifeboat, said Ross, would have carried 40 people. He hurried to the room and told his wife there was danger. Dressing quickly, they went on deck to witness the lifeboat leaving not 30 feet away. Ross said that he called to the men to return, but they would not. They stood on the water-covered deck and put on life preservers, but the vessel went down so quickly that they had no time to jump. Ross would be rescued four hours later, and although suffering from hypothermia, he would go on to make a full recovery. Unfortunately, his wife was not so lucky. Her body would later be found floating among the wreckage. Almost as soon as the shipwreck had been reported, attempts to recover the lost gold would begin. In spite of this immediate interest, it would not be until 1934 that any progress was made. Two salvage vessels successfully passed cables underneath the wreck and were successful in transporting it to nearby Green Cove. Unfortunately for the salvage team, an 18-meter section of the ship broke away and remained on the ocean floor, and it was this section that held the majority of the cargo. Since then, many attempts have been made to recover the lost gold, and although a substantial amount of it has been salvaged from the site, it's believed the majority of the gold dust and smaller pieces have been lost forever beneath the waves. 